Hey everyone! I'm excited for you all to meet MIT's Alexa Gomberg. She's a microbiologist whose enthusiasm for bacteria is totally infectious. Let's go! Hey! <laughs> Great to see you. Thanks so much for having me today. Um, thank you to the MIT Nord Anglia Education Collaboration and to Fatima for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk about my favorite thing in the whole world, which are bacteria. So let's get into it. Today, I want to share with you guys a couple questions. Um, first, who am I? Who's this lady talking to you? So we'll talk about who, who Alexa is. Um, and then I want to share with you why I think it's important to learn about bacteria. And if we're going to be talking about bacteria, I also want to tell you what bacteria are and what viruses are, and also what we can learn from bacteria. So let's get into it. Um, I'm Alexa. I am a plant person, and I'm also a people person. So in this top left picture, this is my garden that I put on my roof every summer. I love to grow plants. Um, I also love science. So this is a picture of me and one of my really good friends from high school, and we put together science nights for kids when we were just kids ourselves. So we had a lot of fun doing that. And now this girl and I get to live together at MIT where we're both grad students, which is super fun. Um, I'm also a people person. So this is a picture of me as a cheerleader. I was a cheerleader in high school and in college. And I had the really cool opportunity to cheer in front of a ton of people. Um, so this is me at a game against our rival. And it was actually the first game that we had beat our rival in in 10 years. So as a cheerleader, I learned a lot about how to be happy and be energetic and positive, even when I wasn't doing so well or my team wasn't doing so well. And this skill has helped me a lot in the lab because things don't always go exactly as you want them to when you're growing bacteria. Um, so after college, I got a great opportunity to move from my home state, from California, all the way across the United States to Boston, where I am now at MIT. So here's a picture of me on my first day at MIT. I was really excited to be here. I'm still excited to be here to do my science. But in addition to my science, I also get to do a ton of other really fun things at MIT, like being part of MIT's club gymnastics team. So these are some of my really awesome friends on the club gymnastics team. Um, and here is a picture of me doing a backflip off of the beam at nationals last year. And if you look really closely into the corner here, you're probably gonna see a familiar face. So this is one of your curiosity because of correspondence, Abby, who's a good friend of mine. So, now you know who I am, and I want to direct our attention back to that first picture of my garden on my roof. And this is because plants are really what got me excited about science. When I was little, every year my grandpa would ask me to help him with his garden. So he grew things like tomatoes, and he always used lots of fertilizer and different amounts of water for every plant. So I got really interested in how plants work and how living things react to different environments. Um, so plants are what got me interested in science. I still like plants, but for the rest of the talk, we're going to talk about something you can't actually see in this picture, which are these organisms called bacteria that live in the soil of these plants and actually all around us. So why are bacteria important? Well, I just told you that they live um, in the soil where plants are, so they're important to agriculture. On this picture in the left, you can see what a plant looks like without any bacteria here, versus when you grow it with bacteria, it looks a lot healthier. And so this plant is kind of like a weed, which you don't really want in your garden, but it's helpful in the lab because it grows really fast, right? Um, and so why else are bacteria important? You've probably heard of bacteria in the context of how they hurt people or how they cause disease. And that is true. In this map on the right here, you can see um, areas that are red are areas of the world where bacteria are more dangerous or they cause more deaths every year. But I want to point out that out of all the bacteria that were counted in this study, half of those deaths were caused by only five different bacteria. So there are way more bacteria out there than just the ones that cause diseases to humans. And some of those are doing really, really interesting things. For example, um, I like to think of bacteria as different chemical factories. That means that they can kind of do magic through science by turning one thing into another. For example, um, there's a bacteria called lactobacillus that turns milk into yogurt and how it, just like in this picture here. So if you've ever compared milk to yogurt, you'll notice that milk is a lot less thick and it doesn't have that soury taste that yogurt can have. So how the bacteria are turning milk into yogurt is they're converting the sugars in milk into a different thing called lactic acid. And that's what makes yogurt have that 
thick texture and that sour taste. Uh, I also think bacteria are important because they're sources of really cool biological tools, but I'm going to save that to the end and hopefully I can convince you that those are really cool. So I just talked about bacteria a bunch. What actually are they? First of all, bacteria are about a million times smaller than me and you. So humans are about one, one and a half meters tall. Bacteria are a million times smaller than that. So much so that we can't even see them with just our eyes. We have to use a special tool called a microscope to take a look at them. And if you're wondering what's behind me, these are pictures of bacteria that I took on a microscope last month. Um, so that's really exciting for me. And since it's hard to imagine what a million times smaller than us is, I want you to imagine what's a million times bigger than us. And one example of that is it, the distance between two cities in Australia, which is a big chunk of Australia's coastline, um, from Brisbane to Sydney, and it would take you 200 hours to walk that distance, which is a million times bigger than a human being. Cool, so I just told you bacteria are a million times smaller than humans. What else are they? Well, bacteria can grow and divide. So in this cartoon, you can see these happy looking bacteria sort of get stretched out. They pinch off in the middle and then form two separate bacteria. And I have a video of this here too. You can see the bacteria stretching, pinching off in the middle, and then we get two bacteria. So this is a video that was taken over three hours. And in the, this course of three hours, one bacteria divided twice, which means I went from one bacteria to two bacteria and two bacteria to four bacteria, which is really helpful for me that they grow that fast because sometimes I make mistakes in the lab and I lose some of my bacteria or I don't have enough. So then I can just wait a little bit longer and have more. It's really convenient. <laughs> So I just told you that bacteria can grow and divide. They need stuff inside them to make that happen. So the first thing I wanna tell you about that a bacteria has is something to separate what's inside the bacteria from the outside, right? Just like we have skin to separate the outside from the inside, bacteria have a cell wall, which is this purple line here that keeps all the good stuff they want in and all the other stuff out. So one of the things they wanna keep inside is this stringy stuff here, which is DNA. DNA, if you want to try to pronounce it, is deoxyribonucleic acid. And this is basically the instructions that the cell uses on how to make itself. So that's stringy stuff here. It's called DNA. Um, and then what actually carries out those instructions are these bits called proteins. And so those are represented by these little circles here. Proteins read the instructions um, that the DNA has, and they carry out all of those instructions. So what can bacteria do with all of that fun stuff inside them? It's not that different to what we can do. So bacteria can actually change to their environment under some circumstances. They can communicate with their neighbors. And really interesting to me, they can become infected by viruses, just like humans can be infected by viruses. So I just told you they can get infected by viruses, but what are viruses? You can think of a virus as a piece of DNA, which is on only goal is to make more copies of itself. So sometimes they look like this. This is a picture of the coronavirus. And you and me know viruses because sometimes when humans get viruses, they make us cough. Um, so that this virus is getting into our human cells and it's using our cells to make more copies of itself. And as a result, sometimes we get sick. What does that look like? Well, um, this virus doesn't have um, proteins inside of itself to make more copies like our cells do. So it tries to find a host cell, which is depicted by this orange circle here, to then trick it into making more copies of itself. What that looks like is that the virus will get recognized by a receptor on this host cell here, and then it gets brought into that host. It puts its DNA into the cell, and the cell thinks, oh, DNA, I know what to do with that. I use it to make the things that it tells me to make. So it's making all the things that the virus tells it to. And in this way, the virus tricks the cell into using it to accomplish its goal, which is making more copies of itself. And so once that's all done, the virus has accomplished its goal of making more copies. And unfortunately for the cell, in order for the virus to get out, it needs to break open the cell and kill it. So the virus has accomplished its goal, but in the meantime, that cell has died. What's really interesting to me is that in some cases, this virus can use a host cell, which is a human cell. For example, viruses that make us sick use human cells, but there can also be viruses that use bacteria to make more copies of themselves. So let's dig into that. 
how do viruses infect bacteria? So I brought back this sort of rod-shaped bacteria and a different looking virus um, to talk about how viruses get into bacteria. So the first step, actually all the steps, are really similar to how viruses infect human cells. First, the virus needs to attach to the cell, then its DNA goes into the host cell, it makes more copies of itself, and then it assembles that virus and breaks open the cell. Here's a fun video of how that happens. This angry looking virus is making more copies of itself inside a sad little bacteria, and then it gets to break open and the virus has accomplished its goal, which is kind of a bummer for the bacteria. And I'm someone who likes bacteria, so I'm really interested in how bacteria get to fight back against the viruses that infect them. So here we have some, some bacteria that are ready to fight back against their viruses, and they're using things like swords and bows and arrows. But I want you to imagine instead that they're using tiny proteins that are essentially swords that fight back against these viruses. How are they doing that? Well, in just two examples, bacteria could block any of the steps that the viruses need to get inside their cells. So the first cell that I, the first step that I told you about was that the virus needs to attach to the bacterial cell. Well, a bacteria could change something that's on the surface of its cell so that the virus no longer recognizes it. And then that virus would not be able to get into that cell. So that's one way that a bacteria could fight back. Another way is more, di more direct. Anytime a virus puts its DNA into that cell, the cell could say, that doesn't look like my DNA, and it could attack it and chop it up. And that way, the cell would not make interpret that um, the instructions on that DNA, and the virus wouldn't make more copies of itself. This part is really interesting to me because that means that the cell has to have some way of distinguishing what its DNA is and what's not its DNA. So in this picture, I've shown that um, the bacteria's DNA is red and the virus's DNA is blue. In real life, they're not really different colors, but there are different ways that the bacteria knows what's its information. So then that way, when something else tries to copy, tries to look like a bacteria, it says, no, 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 I'm not going to fall for that trick. So that's one way that bacteria can fight back. Um, and sort of related, that last thing I wanted to talk to us about is what we can learn from bacteria. So there is one really interesting method called CRISPR-Cas, which is something you might have heard about. It got a really big prize um, that we had in science a few years ago. And there's a lot of people at MIT doing cool work on it. Um, and so in this system, a bacteria has a memory of a virus that's infected it before. So if this red DNA in this virus had tried to infect this bacteria before, the bacteria would have some sort of memory that the virus had been there before. It would keep that. And then the next time the virus tried to infect it, um, the cell would tell a protein, so this is like the bacteria's DNA and its memories of the virus, it would tell a protein, this we're going to call the CRISPR protein or the Cas protein, which are basically little molecular scissors, to attack the virus's DNA that it looks like. So this is really interesting because it's a specific, it's telling the protein to cut somewhere super specific in that DNA. And some really clever scientists have figured out a way to use this for human disease. So humans also have DNA, we have instructions, and sometimes those instructions get mistakes in them. Um, and if that happens, you might imagine that it could lead to diseases for humans. And so we wanna fix those mistakes. We want cool tools, engineering tools to fix those mistakes in humans so that we can also fix diseases. And so some smart scientists have figured out a way to adapt this to target um, this purple protein towards any mistake in our human genome. So an example of this, maybe your genome had a mistake where it said, had a wrong word or a wrong instruction in there that said biology is not cool. You could direct this protein, these little scissors to that word not and cut it out so that then you could have the correct sequence in your genome, which would say things like biology is really cool. So I hope that was interesting to you. Um, I asked you a bunch of questions today. I really like asking questions. It's my favorite part of being a scientist. And my favorite part is getting to ask questions with really cool people. So I hope that you guys want to share your questions with me um, and that we can talk about them. Thank you so, so much, Alexa. To kick us off um, for that Q&A, we have a question submitted uh, from uh, Mateo. Um, and he's wondering, 
do bacteria have an immune system of sorts that help prevent virus infections? Wow. Thank you so much for bringing up the words immune system, Mateo. I'm so excited to talk about this. Um, a lot of us know that humans have immune systems, which give us sort of a memory um, to protect a memory of something that's tried to infect us before. So this is where the idea of vaccines come in. If you get a vaccine um, for a particular disease, then your body's seen it before, it generates a memory of that. And the next time it tries to infect your body, you're already ready to go. You already have cells that know how to attack that disease. And so the example that I showed of the CRISPR system was sort of like a bacterial memory immune system, which is really cool because people didn't think before that was um, discovered that bacteria could be as complex and as sort of like intelligent in how they dealt with their viruses as humans could. Thank you so much for asking that. That is so, so cool. And it shows that we're still learning so, so much about all the amazing life around us. And that leads me to my next question from Hassini. And Hassini is wondering, does this mean that viruses and bacteria have some sort of parasitic relationship? And also, are viruses the only microorganisms that can infect bacteria? Wow, there is a lot there, Hassini. Thanks so much for bringing this up. Um, great question. So you asked a lot of things in there. Do viruses and bacteria have a parasitic relationship? You could say that for sure. So viruses are sort of predators of bacteria, right? They're one of the only things that can attack them and break them down if they're just in the natural environment. Um, I wanna say bacteria can also do this to other bacteria. So bacteria can be predators to other bacteria, which is really cool and really complicated and really fun to think about. Um, and the second part of that question was, are there other things that can infect bacteria? So besides viruses, um, so that means something that could get into the cell and move around. Um, I actually study something that's kind of similar to that. So it's not exactly like a virus, but it can act like a virus in a lot of ways. Um, and so these move not by breaking open a cell, but by spreading through contacting another cell that doesn't have that piece of DNA. And so you might've wondered what's behind me. These are bacteria um, and they this guy in blue green here is one of the pieces of DNA that I study that that in this example will turn the cell green. Thank you for asking. That is so, so neat. Okay, and more on this immune system uh, that you know bacteria kind of have that we've recently discovered. Pranika is wondering, how will the bacteria actually remember that virus? Because wouldn't the virus have already killed the bacteria from the first time it was infected? Like, how does that memory happen? How does it recognize it? Yeah. That's really interesting, Pranika. I'm really glad you mentioned that, that that's, um, there's sort of like a, um, a timing issue to this, right? If the virus needs to um, infect a cell and it breaks it open to do that, it's got to act really quickly in order for that ha to happen. So there's also has to be some sort of really quick response by which the bacteria can then either stop the virus through another way and then use its DNA for memory or maybe it's using that same CRISPR system to block it directly. Um, so there's some sort of like cool timing thing happening there. And if you're more interested, there are tons of researchers studying CRISPR systems and defense systems like this at MIT. So there's a lot of research to learn about. That is just like too neat. So we have another question from a North Anglia student wondering, do all bacteria have these CRISPR proteins that you're discussing? No. So they are found in a lot of bacteria, but definitely not all of them. In fact, bacteria are so diverse that it's there's almost always an exception when you're saying a question about bacteria. So there's so many different ways that bacteria can live and can survive threats from viruses. Um, there's a lot of different um, strategies bacteria can use. And CRISPR systems are just one strategy that bacteria can use to fight against viruses. And so you you mentioned that, you know, there are, you know, a lot of bacteria have them, but not all. We have a question from Aryavir, and Aryavir is wondering, how many types of bacteria are there? Are there a lot? What are we talking about? We're talking a lot. Oh, my gosh. Um, thanks for asking this question, too, because we don't even know how many there are yet. Some scientists want to say that there's a trillion of different bacteria out there. 
And this is a number that is changing every day as we're learning more about just how much diversity is out there. Um, this is also not a super easy question to answer because you can imagine that there's bacteria on every surface of our planet, right? Bacteria were the, some of the first organisms to be present on our planet when it first formed, um, which Fatima knows a lot more about than I do. And if you could talk, you could talk about that. But um, that means that there's a lot of different places that we probably haven't even been to on the planet that we don't know who's there yet. Um, and the traditional ways that we find out where bacteria, what bacteria are, are around is that we take them back to our lab and we see what grows in our lab. And you can imagine that whatever we're trying to do in our lab might not cover all of the complex things that bacteria could be doing in their natural environments, right? If we try to grow them alone, they might not so if you try to grow one bacteria alone, it might not be as happy as it is in its natural environment where it has other bacteria that it depends on in that community, um, which is a really interesting thing that bacteria collaborate in this way and that we can't always study them one by one. Um, so some very clever scientists about 20 years ago started using a different approach where instead they get all of the DNA sequences of bacteria in a certain environment and they use tools on the computer to figure out how many bacteria there are, which is really fun. Um, and I'm not doing that work, but there's a lot of really interesting people doing that type of thing. And they estimate that there could be around trillions of different bacteria groups. Wow, that is a lot. And that's just so exciting because maybe some of the North Anglia students on this call who are really interested in biology can play a big role in discovering some of the ones that we haven't found yet and bringing them back to the lab. So Alexa, you described to us that, you know, you go out into the environment when you're searching for these microbes and you try to bring it back into the lab and you take a look at it. And you mentioned during your talk, you do that using a microscope, right? And so I have a question from Manasi and Manasi's wondering, how did scientists first discover that viruses could infect the bacteria? Did they notice that like through a microscope? How did they figure that out? Hi, Manasi. Um, thanks so much for asking this question. Um, it's really interesting. There was a lot of work on viruses done almost 80 years ago or even more than that now. Um, and so well, I don't know originally how they found viruses. Oftentimes discoveries in science are made through happy accidents. So for example, sometimes there are viruses that are found because if you're happily growing your, if you're a scientist like me, happily growing your bacteria in a lab and you get a virus in your cells, what that might look like is that all of your really, really cloudy liquid that has a bunch of bacteria in it will turn clear. And that's because the, the liquid is cloudy because it has lots of bacteria in it. So they're blocking light from getting through. And when that virus infects all those cells, what's happening is the cells are breaking open. So now light can get through and that's why the culture looks really clear. So I imagine one way people could identify viruses is just from happy accidents, from getting a virus in their culture that they didn't want to. Um, this is also really similar to how people discovered the antibiotic penicillin. You might have heard of penicillin because um, you might be allergic to it. Sometimes kids can be allergic to penicillin. Um, it's a super useful tool that we can use to fight bacteria that are causing disease for us. But it was also discovered from a happy accident from someone getting a um, fungus on their plate. Fungus is kind of like bacteria. We need microscopes to see them. Mushrooms, if you ever eat those, are a type of fungus. Um, but these are more, these are smaller. So they can grow on something called a Petri dish, which is this little circle thing that has a, a little thick piece of nutrients of food for your bacteria. And a scientist discovered that a fungus that had accidentally gotten on its plate was making something, right? It was being a chemical factory. And that thing it was making was killing the bacteria around it. So that's how that antibiotic penicillin was discovered. That is so cool. And now, you know, that that medicine that you mentioned is so important when we maybe get sick with bacteria and they get into our bodies. And that leads me to um, another question uh, from a North Anglia student who's wondering, you mentioned that um, viruses can affect animal cells like our cells and bacterial cells. And Jay Vardon is, is wondering, what about plants? Can viruses infect plant cells too? Wow. Yes, viruses can infect plant cells. Um, and it's really interesting because they do it in a similar way. So all of these strategies that viruses have evolved are kind of conserved across um, lots of different groups of living things. And viruses infecting plants are also a really big issue for people who work in agriculture or who are interested in conserving different forests. So sometimes tree populations can be at risk of getting viruses and you might see um, that 
they're not doing as well if you're going on a hike or you're walking through the woods, that could actually be, be because of a disease. Got it. And, you know, kind of speaking of, you know, viruses and infection, um, we have a few questions in the chat that are still about um, CRISPR and this sort of, you know, bacterial approach to an immune system. And so Yatna is wondering, so of the bacteria that have like CRISPR, um, do they have a limited memory? Can they get, you know, can they only recognize a few things? What's the limit to what they can recognize and, and use um, to protect themselves? Great question, Yatna. Yeah, and scientists asked this question too when they first learned about these systems. Um, so if you are interested in how many viruses um, this system can have immunity to, and you know that viruses uh, or that um, bacteria store the DNA that looks like the virus in their, in their DNA, you can actually just look through that bacteria's DNA to see how many different viruses they have immunity to. And so when scientists looked into this, it was always between 20 to 30. Um, so it can be a lot of viruses. And some of the first scientists who were studying these saw that when a new virus gets infected or a new virus um, attacks a bacteria in the lab, that actually a new piece of DNA gets inserted into, the, into that same area of the genome, uh, which is really cool. So you can actually see that happen in science. Well, and that, that leads perfectly into Rachel's question. And she's wondering from that really nice figure you showed us where it says biology is not cool and it gets corrected to biology is cool, which I agree with. Um, Rachel's wondering if those purple proteins cut out that mistake, how do they reattach the parts again or what goes in, in the space after they've cut things out Yeah, in, in, in humans, for example? It's a really interesting question, Rachel, because you can imagine that it would be a really bad thing for human cells if there was just a break in your DNA. That would be really bad. That might result in a lot of mistakes or you might even lose the pieces of DNA that get caught. So it's really important that those pieces get stitched back together. And so that's part of the same process. What's really cool is that these same proteins um, can cut out a piece of DNA and reattach it. Got it. And now I have a question from Tiara and Tiara is wondering, how has your experience in cheerleading and the scientific curiosity you got, you know, from the early days gardening um, primed you or positioned you to make uh, these cool discoveries and images in the lab um, uh, in your research? How has that helped? Has it contributed? Have you brought cheerleading and that curiosity with you here? Yes. Um, super interesting question. Thank you, Tiara. Um, so I was a cheerleader for about eight years maybe a little bit more, it's hard to count now. Um, and one of the things that was most impactful to me about being a cheerleader is actually learning how to work in a team really well. So if you're a cheerleader, you work in a stunt group, which means that there's three of you there trying to lift one person in the air. So if one person isn't around, you can't do your stunt and you can't do your cheerleading and you all have to work together to make that goal happen. So through cheerleading, I learned how to be sort of a respectful teammate and how to ask questions in order to help people and not accuse them of things instead. So I learned how to be a good teammate and a good friend in cheerleading. And um, that was really important when I started working in a lab, because even though you might think of scientists working by themselves a lot, in reality, we're always asking people questions. And sometimes the people we're asking questions to are also our friends. Um, usually most of the times they are. And so they're, be they're really helpful in talking to your science and brainstorming ideas and figuring out why things aren't working. So I would say that's my first answer is being a good teammate. And the other thing that I learned from cheerleading is that sometimes it's really important when you're feeling frustrated with your work to take a break from it, to go do something else for a while. And so for me right now, that thing is gymnastics. For growing up, that was cheerleading. And so having those different things allows me to get out anything that I'm feeling frustrated about or upset about. I can get that out when I'm doing my physical activity. And oftentimes I'll be frustrated about an experiment or something not going well in the lab. And I'll go to gymnastics and I'll do a couple flips. And then it just hits me what was wrong. So it's a really cool tool that I have to be able to balance doing um, really hard science. Coming up with new information is really hard, but it's also really fun um, with also being active and having a silly time. 
That's, that's awesome. And I think that's such an important um, concept to cover, especially as we're all, you know, working really hard in school or in the labs ourselves. Sometimes you do have to take a step back and you have to ask questions and you also have to take care of yourself. Um, and at the beginning of your response, uh, Alexa, you mentioned working in a team for cheerleading and when you were doing stunts, and that's really, really important. And that helped you um, learn how to work in a team in the lab. And so Ashray is wondering, who do you work with in your research? Like, who's in your area? Are you surrounded by biologists and microbiologists? What does that look like? Yeah. Hi, Ashray. Thanks so much for asking about this, because the people I work with are some of my favorite parts of doing science. Um, in general, I think the MIT community is really welcoming. And um, the other students who I work with in my program or in my lab or in my building are always so excited to talk to me about what I'm doing, to troubleshoot what's going on, and to sort of brainstorm, like, what are the bigger things that could be happening in biology with? Sometimes we get really philosophical with what we're discussing. And who these people are, are people in other labs than me. Sometimes they're people in the same lab. Sometimes they're grad students or they work in the lab. Um, oftentimes it's my advisor who I work really closely with and I get to have really fun conversations about science with. That's great. And I know you also have some lab mates behind you in that picture. And so speaking <laughs> of those lab mates, Aryavir is wondering, what type of bacteria do you work on? Can you tell us what it's called and what it does? Totally. Thank you for the question. Um, so this bacteria is called Bacillus subtilis. It's a bacteria that people have been studying for a really long time in the lab. And that's partly because we have a lot of tools that we can use to ask really interesting questions with this bacteria. Um, so what does it do? What makes it kind of interesting? Well, one thing that's weird about this bacteria is called a spore former. So that means that when Bacillus my friend Bacillus, my lab mate, when it experiences stress, sometimes what it can do is this thing called sporulation. And if that would be, if for example, this bacteria right behind me that you guys can see, if it got stressed, maybe it didn't have enough food in its environment and it didn't think it could grow in that moment, it would essentially form a tiny little cell that only has DNA inside of it and a really hard exterior. And that way, um, when the cell around it that it's now inside of dies, that thing called a spore could survive really harsh conditions. And something that's really interesting, I don't know if they were bacillus spores, so don't quote me on this, but there were bacterial spores found on the outside of the ISS or the International Space Station. So when that came back or when um, pods from that came back to Earth, you could find spores of bacteria on the outside of it and actually they could still grow. So these things are really resistant to damage. So that's one thing that I find cool about this bacteria. Um, if you have other questions, talk to me, you should ask them because I can I could talk about bacillus all day. <laughs> so oh. you should stop me. No, no, this is great. Well, then I have a follow-up question from Aryav and, and Ar Aryav is wondering, you know, you're working with these bacteria. Ha you know, how do you stay safe? Do people get sick working with bacteria in the lab, especially if, if these things can survive in space conditions? You know, how do you keep yourself safe? How do you protect yourself with your immune system? That's a really great and important question, Aryev, and I'm glad that you asked it. Um, so MIT has a great and most places doing research with um, anything that could be dangerous. Have really awesome teams of people. Um, here they're called environmental and health safety people. And they're going around the labs, making sure everyone is doing the correct safe things um, with these bacteria. And we also have different levels of safety, depending on how potentially dangerous that organism could be to you. So for example, when, um, people were starting to study the coronavirus, it was really dangerous and we didn't know how it infected humans. And so that would be a really high safety level. This organism behind me is the very lowest safety level. So it's not, it doesn't cause diseases in anyone. And um, it's also used as a probiotic. So you might've heard this word in the context of having good bacteria in your body. And, and it's true that if we had no bacteria in the world, humans would not be able to survive. And that's because our bodies depend on having bacteria. Um, and so having good bacteria around you can be helpful. So even though some bacteria are dangerous, a lot of people study bacteria that are good for you. Um, and so if you, you know, hadn't had an accident where some of those were exposed, you would clean it up really quickly in a way that they couldn't um, cause any damage to you. But it's also not as much of a concern as it is with um, bacteria that are more dangerous. I'm uh, glad you brought that up. 
Yeah. Well, we're glad that you're staying safe and being careful um, in, in all of these things, especially um, with microbes. And I know you just mentioned um, Bacillus subtilis is not the most dangerous one, but we want you to stay safe so you can keep doing awesome work. And uh, we're wondering now from Mihika, Mihika's wondering, how did you get interested in MIT in the first place? And I see MIT on your shirt as well over there. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about why here and, and what you're up to when you're not in the lab. Yeah, thanks so much, Mika, for asking that. Um, I also could talk about this all day because I think some of the people here, particularly the other grad students that I get to interact with, are some of the most inspiring. Um, and so we have this program um, through MIT called the Microbiology PhD program. And a lot of microbiology at other schools is tends to be focused on um, just bacteria that hurt people. So just bacteria that cause diseases or just bacteria in the environment. So that would like just be the soil bacteria that I talked about very briefly. Um, and what I like about MIT is that there's people doing all of those things. There's people who are doing really interesting stuff with bacteria in the oceans through the Woods Hole program. And there's also people doing really interesting work on how to use bacteria um, in ways that help humans, like in Malik and Miles' talk a few weeks ago. Um, so what I like about MIT is that people see bacteria sort of in the way that I see them. I don't really, I'm really interested in what they're doing and not where they're doing it. Um, and so for me, that's one thing I like about MIT. That's awesome. And what's going on, on on your shirt? I know mine is written with math, but are those microbes? These are microbes. So I helped design this t-shirt with a really talented friend of mine. And this is the new t-shirt for the club that I'm a part of, which is the MIT Microbiome Club. And I'm glad you brought that up, Fatima, because the Microbiome Club is another way that I really get to enjoy MIT. So I'm just able to be surrounded by people who are really fascinated by bacteria and by microbes and how they interact with humans. And um, we can share that joy with the community. So I think two weeks ago now, we hosted a big symposium, which is sort of like a conference where people give different talks about what they're working on. And it's a really great way to connect with people in the field and just sort of be like happy nerds together, right? That's the point of all of this is sharing what makes us excited and um, how how we're how we are specifically nerds about bacteria. I think that's so exciting and so cool. So I have a couple of questions about that. So um, first, how can we learn more about the club? And then second, could you walk us through what a microbiome actually is? I know that bacteria are in microbiomes, but could you tell us what that is? Totally. Yes. So um, if you want to learn more about the club, you could Google the MIT Microbiome Club. Um, we have a new website up, which was really fun to make. And soon, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be putting talks up there from this symposium that we had. Um, and then your next question was, what even is a microbiome, right? So microbiomes are usually defined as the, con the um, collective part of um, your body, which is your cells and the bacteria that are there. So usually when we think about the body, we just think about the cells that are 100% human, right? All of my DNA in my body is supposed to be 100% Alexa, and all of your DNA is 100% Fatima. But in reality, there are bacteria and different types of microorganisms that cover a lot of different surfaces in our bodies. And so all of the DNA that's in our bodies is not necessarily our own. And so the microbiome refers to that. And in particular, people think about the gut. So where your food goes after it's in your stomach and before it leaves your body is called the gut. And there are bacteria, tons and tons of bacteria in there that are breaking down parts of your food for you and making sure you get extra nutrients. And so they break down all of that complex food like fibers um, and then into smaller components, which then give our cells energy. Other microbiomes that are really interesting are on your skin. Um, your skin has lots of different bacteria. And there are some cool scientists at MIT who have found that those bacteria actually change after puberty. There's like differences in the oils on your faces that attract different bacteria to your skin before and after puberty. So that's just another snapshot of the cool research that people are doing here on the bacteria on your body, in your body. Um, if I could just also say, we're also interested in microbiomes of different organisms. So animals in zoos have totally different microbiomes than we do sometimes. So it's really interesting to think about all the different types of ways that microbes could, or microbes or bacteria could be interacting with different organisms. 
um, especially for agriculture or for your things like your pet's health. Yeah, that is so darn cool. And, you know, I think I mean, I'm very inspired right now to learn way more about biology. And I think we have a lot of students on the call who are as well as a closing question. Unfortunately, we can't ask all the amazing open questions still, but could you leave us with some advice for the students on the call who might want to follow your footsteps and become microbiologists as well? Totally. Um, yeah, it's, it's so interesting because I never would have imagined that I would be doing what I'm doing now. Um, in the particular questions that I'm asking my life and over the past, like, I don't know how long, eight years, maybe of being interested in, in science has changed a lot. And so my only advice is follow what you're curious about and don't, I guess, get, or, um, follow what you're curious about. And as long as you're curious about it and excited, um, the right questions will follow. And as one caveat to that, also find the people who make you really excited to come to work every day um, and to ask those questions. So find what, if you're curious about something, go think about that. You don't need to think about whatever is the coolest thing at the moment. Um, and also make sure you're doing it with people who you really like. I think that is absolutely wonderful advice. And I wanted to thank you so much, Alexa, for sharing your time with us today and all these fantastic insights. I learned a tremendous amount. Um, I know we're all really excited about bacteria and, and the research that you do at MIT as well. And with that, I'd also like to thank the Nordanglia students for asking such spectacular and great science questions today in the chat. Um, that was just so, so fun. And I'd also like to thank the MIT Nordanglia Education Collaboration for making this series possible. And with that, I want to thank you again, Alexa, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. This was spectacular. Thank, thank you. So Thanks, Alexa. Bye, everyone.